Today, we begin a course entitled The Principles of Economics, Business, Banking, Finance, and Your Everyday Life. Your professor is Peter Navarro, a professor of business at the University of California, Irvine. He holds a Ph.D. in economics from Harvard University and is the author of the best-selling investment book, If It's Raining in Brazil, by Starbucks. His latest book is The Well-Timed Strategy, Managing the Business Cycle for Competitive Advantage, which illustrates how a knowledge of macroeconomics can improve executive decision-making. Professor Navarro's articles have appeared in a wide range of publications, from the Harvard Business Review, Sloan Management Review, and the Wall Street Journal, to the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. He has made frequent guest appearances on major financial news stations, including Bloomberg Television, CNBC, and CNN. This course introduces the subjects of macroeconomics and microeconomics. Macroeconomics focuses on the big economic picture, specifically how the overall national and global economies perform. Our study focuses on big problems like unemployment and inflation, and the dire threats that large budget deficits and trade deficits can pose for economic well-being. At a business and professional level, macroeconomics can help answer such questions as, how much should I manufacture this month? How much inventory should I maintain? Should I invest in new plant and equipment, expand into foreign markets, or downsize my firm? At a personal level, macroeconomics can also help to answer equally important questions, should I switch jobs or ask for a raise? Should I buy a house now or wait until next year? Should I get a variable or fixed rate mortgage? And what about my investments for retirement? In contrast, microeconomics deals with the behavior of individual markets and the businesses, consumers, investors, and workers who make up the macroeconomy. Microeconomics focuses on issues such as how prices are set, how wages are determined, how rents are set, and why the government is sometimes forced to regulate industries that are too monopolistic, that pollute too much, or that may conceal vital information. By studying the trends, fluctuations, and events that affect the market, we'll learn how seemingly distant political, economic, and environmental incidents actually shape our personal lives and businesses. For more information on this course, please visit its web page at www.modernscholar.com, where you'll have access to links to related sites, a seminar room to share your thoughts with other students, and, yes, of course, a final exam. And now we begin the principles of economics, business, banking, finance, and your everyday life. Lecture number one, Introduction to Macro and Microeconomics. And now, Professor Navarro. Hi, I'm Peter Navarro, and I'd like to welcome you to this introductory course in economics. I've taught this incredibly useful subject to literally thousands of undergraduate and MBA students in my career at the University of California. And from that experience, I can tell you this. Yes, economics can be a very difficult subject at times, but economics is also one of the most interesting and readily applicable subjects that you can ever learn. So, to start off on what I believe will be for you a very profitable journey, I'd like to first distinguish between the two main branches of economics. Macroeconomics, which will be the focus of the first seven lectures in this course, and microeconomics, which we will cover a bit in this introductory lecture, and then also in lectures 8 through 14. So, just what is macroeconomics? Well, the word macro means big or large, and macroeconomics focuses on the big economic picture, specifically how the overall national and global economies perform. It is a subject that focuses on big problems like unemployment and inflation and the dire threats that large budget deficits and trade deficits can pose for our economic well-being. In contrast, the study of microeconomics deals with the behavior of individual markets and the businesses, consumers, investors, and workers that make up the macro economy. This is a subject that focuses on issues like how prices are set in places where we shop, how the wages we earn are determined by our employers, how rents are set in buildings where we live or do business, 
and why the government is sometimes forced to regulate industries that are too monopolistic, which pollute too much, or which may conceal vital information from us. Now, what we're going to do in this introductory lecture is first examine a bit more closely some of the big issues in macroeconomics and illustrate quite specifically how this subject affects you in both your personal and professional life. Then, in the last part of this lecture, we will do something very similar for microeconomics. At a business and professional level, macroeconomics can help answer questions like, how much should I manufacture this month, and how much inventory should I maintain? Should I invest in new plant and equipment, expand into foreign markets, or downsize my firm? At a personal level, macroeconomics can help answer equally important questions like, should I switch jobs or ask for a raise? Should I buy a house now or wait until next year? Should I get a variable or fixed rate mortgage? Macroeconomics can help answer these questions because it arms us with a new way of thinking about the world we live and work in. Let me show you what I mean with some examples first from the world of business and then from the perspective of one's own personal life. Item. The economy is at full employment, the stock market is soaring, and everything is wonderful. That's, of course, precisely when the Federal Reserve starts to raise interest rates an unlucky seven times in 18 months for a total of over 250 basis points. How long will it take before the news tightens around your business? Item. A new president gets elected and promptly makes good on his promise to dramatically cut taxes. Your company gears up for a big surge in consumption and gets exactly that. But the economy also gets a big dose of inflation, an even bigger dose of contractionary monetary policy, and a very quick and big bust that turns into an ugly stagflation. Did your company see it coming, or did it get caught in that downdraft? Item. The dollar strengthens dramatically against the euro and yen. How can that possibly affect you? Well, maybe it can't, at least not directly. But wait, it turns out that one of your biggest customers is a company that relies heavily on its export sales to Europe. As these sales dry up because of the strong dollar, your orders do too. So when exactly did you know you had a problem? The broader point with these business examples is that you can have the best managed company in the world. You can have the most efficient production line. You can even have the best sales and marketing team. But even with these kinds of assets, your company can still lose a ton of money if you and your fellow employees don't know what to do when the macroeconomic rains begin to fall. Of course, the same is true in your personal life as well. To illustrate this point, let's consider this very real situation of the fictional Kristen Sands and why it ended quite badly. Kristen is a single working mother whose big dream in life is to own her own home. As the marketing director for a major corporation, Kristen earns a good salary and some years ago she had saved $25,000 for a house down payment. After months of looking, Kristen's choice had boiled down to either a modest two-bedroom condo near her job in the city or her dream home, a more expensive single-family house out in the valley. After talking it over with a mortgage banker, Kristen decided that the only way she could afford her dream home was to take out a variable rate mortgage. It was available at a full two percentage points below the fixed rate mortgage and her monthly mortgage payment would be several hundred dollars less, but only if interest rates stayed low. Sure, Kristen felt a little nervous about choosing the variable rate, but the mortgage banker told her not to worry. Rates had been stable for over three years now, and it shouldn't be any problem. What Kristen failed to see, however, were numerous warning signs of growing inflationary pressures. On the demand pull side, the unemployment rate had just reached an eight-year low. On the cost push side, the news was full of stories about a bad coffee crop in Brazil, a worldwide drought and possible food shortages, renewed violence in the Middle East and rising oil prices, and a fall in the value of the dollar. Sure enough, within two years, interest rates had climbed into the double digits, and Kristen could no longer afford her skyrocketing mortgage payments. 
With the climb in interest rates, the economy plunged into a recession, taking the real estate market down with it. For six months, Kristen tried to sell her house at the original price, but finally, facing the humiliation of foreclosure, she unloaded it for $25,000 less than she had bought it for, losing every cent of her original equity down payment. The tragedy is that Kristen could have avoided her hardship if she had only been armed with the power of macroeconomic thinking. Anticipating increased interest rates in a possible recession, Kristen could have either bought that less expensive condo with a fixed rate mortgage or, better yet, waited until the real estate market went soft and bought her dream home at an affordable price. In this course, I'm going to teach you not only how to quickly recognize rapidly emerging macroeconomic problems like inflation or recession, equally important, I'm also going to show you how to incorporate this information into the most important professional and personal economic decisions you make, from landing that first job and getting your first car or house to planning for retirement and cashing that first Social Security check. To lay the foundation for the next six lectures on macroeconomics, let's briefly survey the big problems, such as unemployment and inflation, that all economies face, and the fiscal policy and monetary policy tools that the government regularly uses to address them. The first big problem centers around the business cycle. That cycle can turn down and cause recessions and associated unemployment, or turn sharply upward and spark inflation. In either case, this business cycle volatility can wreak havoc on your business or personal life. Accordingly, in Lecture 2, one of the things I'm going to do is illustrate the common phases of the business cycle and talk about the many and various factors that can trigger recessions and inflation. In this regard, a central concern of both macroeconomists and the political leaders they serve is to determine what the best fiscal and monetary policies are to counter either recessionary downturns in the business cycle or too rapid expansions that can trigger inflationary pressures. In Lecture 2, I am also going to introduce you to the five so-called warring schools of macroeconomics, schools like Keynesians and monetarists and supply-side economists. This will set the stage for our discussion of fiscal policy and budget deficits in Lecture 3, as well as monetary policy and money and banking in Lecture 4. In discussing these warring schools, we will see that the Keynesians and the monetarists and the supply-siders all have decidedly different views both on how the macroeconomy works and, more importantly, how to use discretionary fiscal and monetary policy to address problems associated with the business cycle. In Lecture 3, we will focus in much more detail on fiscal policy. Fiscal policy uses increased government expenditures or, alternatively, tax cuts to stimulate or expand the economy. And fiscal policy can also be used to contract the economy and fight inflation by reducing government expenditures or raising taxes. Now, when it is used properly, fiscal policy can be a very powerful tool to cure our macroeconomic ills. However, when used irresponsibly, it can lead to large budget deficits that can drive up interest rates and create inflation and choke off even the strongest of economic recoveries. That's why we want to come to understand why this is so, how the dangers of budget deficits can be avoided, and what we can do on our own lives to protect ourselves. Note, however, that fiscal policy is not the only tool that governments use to control the economy. The other major tool is monetary policy, the subject of Lecture 4. Monetary policy uses control over the money supply to set the level of interest rates. When the Federal Reserve wants to slow down an overheated and inflationary economy, it will raise interest rates. This depresses business investment and makes it more expensive for you and I to finance a house or car, causing the economy to slow. And when the Fed, as it is called, wants to stimulate the economy, it lowers interest rates. In Lecture 4, we will learn about exactly how this is done. Plus, we will also look at our system more broadly of money and banking. 
In Lecture 5, we will move on to focus on two of the biggest macroeconomic problems all economies face at one time or another, inflation and unemployment. In this lecture, we will see that inflation is defined as an upward movement in prices from one year to the next. And inflation is typically measured by the percentage change in price indices, such as the consumer price index, the producer price index, or the so-called GDP deflator. For example, the producer price index is based on a number of important raw materials, while the most widely used measure of inflation, the consumer price index, or CPI, is calculated by pricing a market basket of goods and services purchased by a typical household. This market basket includes prices of food, clothing, shelter, fuel, transportation, medical care, college tuition, and other goods and services purchased for day-to-day -day living. Inflation has often been described as the cruelest tax. That's because if inflation rises faster than wages, our purchasing power actually declines, even though our wages may be going up. As for the second macroeconomic problem we will address in Lecture 5, it is in many ways the most important one, at least on Main Street as opposed to Wall Street. The problem I'm talking about is unemployment. The unemployment rate is measured as the number of unemployed persons divided by the number of people in the labor force. And this rate, in fact, has varied dramatically over the years. For example, during the Great Depression of the 1930s, as much as one-fourth of the workforce was idled, while during the 1970s, the U.S. rate jumped into the double digits, along with inflation and interest rates. Normally, however, the unemployment rate is closer to 5% or 6%. In talking about unemployment, it's going to be important to distinguish between three kinds, frictional, cyclical, and structural. Frictional unemployment is the least of the macroeconomist's worries. It occurs as a natural part of the job-seeking process as people quit their jobs just long enough to look for and find another job. Cyclical unemployment, however, is a much more serious problem. It occurs when the economy dips into a recession, and it is this type of unemployment that macroeconomists have historically spent most of their time trying to solve. However, in an increasingly technological age, the third type of unemployment, structural unemployment, has begun receiving more attention. Structural unemployment occurs when a change in technology makes someone's job obsolete. The auto worker replaced by a robot, or the telephone information operator replaced by a worker in India. In fact, such structural unemployment is one of the hardest kinds of unemployment to cure, and one of the most perplexing problems now facing developed countries like the U.S., Germany, and Japan is the so-called outsourcing and offshoring of jobs to foreign countries like India and China, with well-educated workforces willing to work for relatively lower wages a phenomenon that is creating considerable structural unemployment in the countries being affected. Now, the final macroeconomic problem we will focus on is that of trade deficits. In fact, this problem is so big and important, and the topic is so vast, that we are going to devote two lectures to it. In Lecture 6, we are going to examine the economic principles governing international trade. The two big questions we will want to examine in this lecture are these. Why do nations trade? And how do nations decide what to import and export? To answer these questions, we must explore two very important economic concepts. The principle of absolute advantage versus that of comparative advantage. And from this discussion, we will come to understand at a much deeper level why countries often wind up specializing in certain industries and then meeting their economic needs by trading in the vast global economy. Of course, some countries like the United States chronically import more foreign goods than they are able to export. In such cases, a country will experience chronic trade deficits. As we move to Lecture 7, we will see that over time, these resultant chronic trade deficits put tremendous downward pressure on a domestic currency like the dollar or the peso or the yen. 
And as we will also learn, a weakened currency likewise increases inflation because foreign goods become a lot more expensive to buy. So in this pivotal Lecture 7, we will learn a lot about how currencies like the dollar and euro and yen are supposed to adjust to eliminate trade deficits. Now, with Lecture 8, we will switch gears as we begin our series on that other branch of economics called microeconomics. At a business and professional level, microeconomics can help answer questions like, how can my firm minimize its costs and increase its profits? What prices should I charge for my products? Should I invest in new plant and equipment? And how should I respond to an aggressive strategic move by one of my competitors? At a personal level, microeconomics is equally practical. It can help answer questions like, will I really be better off financially if I quit my job now and go back for an MBA degree? What kind of career should I be preparing myself for? And what about that new refrigerator or automobile I want to buy? Should I get the new energy efficient one with a higher price tag or settle for the cheaper model? More broadly, microeconomics can also help you come to understand why the government is so involved in our economic lives. It can do so by answering questions like, why does the government regulate prices in some industries like electricity and gas but not in others? Why are there laws requiring seat belts and motorcycle helmets? Why do we have a federal environmental protection agency and thousands of rules about workplace safety? And why does the government provide some goods like our national defense and lighthouses and let the free market provide other goods like hot dogs and computers? Microeconomics can answer questions like these because it arms us with another very powerful set of conceptual and problem-solving tools. Let me show you how powerful and helpful these microeconomics tools can be by telling you several stories about some fictional people in very real situations. So let's start close to home with a problem you yourself may have already faced in your life. What kind of refrigerator to buy? Priscilla Sanchez will be our fictional volunteer for this example. And Priscilla must choose between a very energy efficient model that costs $750 or the identical refrigerator without the energy saving features for only $500. Since Priscilla just finished a course in microeconomics, she knows about the time value of money. So after calculating the net present value of the energy savings on her electricity bill over the life of the investment, she realizes that the seemingly more expensive refrigerator is actually much cheaper. In fact, Priscilla helped her husband Phil come to a similar conclusion on a completely different topic. Phil was thinking about entering an executive MBA program, but the tuition was very expensive, over $100,000 for the two-year program. Phil's problem in thinking through his decision was that he didn't know how to compare his upfront costs of going to school with the future benefits that would come in the form of a higher salary and better promotional opportunities. So Priscilla once again got out her hand calculator, made some assumptions about Phil's future stream of income after he got his MBA, and it became pretty clear to both of them that the family would be better off financially over the long run with Phil in school now. And that's where Phil is. He sits right next to Stuart Applegate in his microeconomics class. Before losing his job and going back to school, Stuart was the chief executive officer of a high-flying computer software company. However, when his company started to lose money, Stewart's solution was to raise prices in the hopes of boosting revenues and profits. Unfortunately, Stewart came from an engineering background, and because he hadn't studied microeconomics, Stewart didn't understand that the demand for his company's product was what economists call highly elastic. In such a case, raising prices actually reduces both total revenue and profits. The result was that Stewart's pricing strategy bankrupted his company. Of course, I could tell you many more of these stories, but I think you already get the point. As you learn about microeconomics, you will be learning a set of tools and concepts 
that will help you enormously in both your personal and professional life. As for how we will tackle this subject in Lectures 8 through 14, we will start in Lecture 8 with arguably the most famous concept in microeconomics, how the laws of supply and demand determine prices in the marketplace. We will see that demand curves slope downward and that this reflects the idea that the lower the price, the more consumers will want to buy of any product. At the same time, the supply curve slopes upward, indicating that as prices rise, businesses will be willing to provide more of their product. The powerful idea behind this construct is that the so-called equilibrium price in the market will tend to be where the supply and the demand curves cross. In order to understand exactly why this equilibrium happens, we are going to spend a lot of time in lectures 9 and 10 looking more closely at both the demand and supply curves. To understand the downward slope and shape of the demand curve, and indeed why that demand curve may also shift, we will have to look first at the economic behavior of consumers. By the same token, to figure out why the supply curve slopes upward, we will look at so-called production theory, which examines why firms price and produce products the way they do. Once we come to understand these demand and supply curves, it will become very apparent why prices tend towards an equilibrium where the two curves cross. Now in the last part of Lecture 10, and in the entire Lecture 11, we will turn to the broader issue of how markets are organized and structured. Specifically, in the last part of Lecture 10, we will look at the ideal form of market structure, perfect competition. Then, in Lecture 11, we will compare that free market ideal of the famous Adam Smith to three forms of imperfect competition, monopoly, oligopoly, and monopolistic competition. In these lectures, we will see that when a market meets the famous Adam Smith's test of being perfectly competitive, its invisible hand truly is a wondrous mechanism. The free market allocates resources in the most efficient way possible without any help from or interference of the government. However, in these lectures, we will also come to understand that markets are prone to various kinds of so-called market failures that may require the government to intervene to correct these failures. We will see, for example, that when there is only one or a few sellers in the marketplace, that's a monopoly or oligopoly, the monopolists or oligopolists tend to set prices too high and consumption is too low relative to the more efficient outcome that would occur in a free market, perfectly competitive with numerous buyers and sellers. In such a case, government intervention into the market may be appropriate to deal with a monopoly or oligopoly, and such intervention may involve regulating prices and profits or prohibiting actions such as price fixing. Note, however, that the problem of imperfect competition isn't the only reason that the government may intervene in the free market. In fact, there are at least three other forms of market failure that we'll be talking about that you may find even more interesting. One such problem is the so-called public goods problem. It helps explain why the government typically provides for so-called public goods like national defense, lighthouses, and wilderness parks. A second problem is known as the externalities problem. It helps explain why the government requires pollution controls and provides things like education and vaccines. Still a third market failure includes the tongue-twisting problem of asymmetric information. This problem helps explain things like food ingredient labeling and financial disclosure laws. In Lecture 13, we will turn to a problem that seems to be always on our mind, at least once a year, when it's time to prepare our tax forms. In this lecture on government taxation, we will learn about some very important nuts and bolts concepts, like how to determine whether a tax is regressive or progressive. But in this lecture, we will also have a very interesting bonus section on the microeconomics of taxation and the political process.
And you may find this lecture particularly interesting as it provides some insight into why, at least in the American political system, voters are often faced with the choice between a Republican Tweedledum and a Democratic Tweedledee, in which, as Ross Perot once famously put it, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two. Finally, in Lecture 14, to end this course with what I hope is a flourish, we will delve further into the business side of the supply and demand equation by studying how businesses use the three so-called factors of production, land, labor, and capital. A study of land and rents will shed considerable light on how prices are determined in one of the most important markets affecting our lives, that of the housing and apartment markets. A study of the labor market will help us come to understand how our wages are determined and also why superstar athletes and celebrities get paid a lot more than the president or teachers. As for our analysis of the capital markets, this will help us come to better understand how to evaluate the profitability of investments such as those in new plant and equipment. As part of this analysis, we will look at important concepts like the rate of return on capital, and we will also learn how to use that tool that was so helpful to Priscilla Sanchez in her refrigerator decision, namely the tool of net present value. Now, as a final word before we start this course in earnest, at the end of each lecture, I'm going to ask you to complete the review questions and exercises in your course study guide. Of course, you don't have to do this work to enjoy these recorded lectures. However, as a teacher, I can tell you that your learning process will be greatly enhanced if you do try and set aside at least some time for these supplementary study tools. Well, that's it for Lecture 1. I think we're off to a pretty good start. And I'm Peter Navarro. We'll be talking again soon together as we explore the mysteries of macroeconomics and then microeconomics. After listening to Lecture 1, a student posed this question to Professor Navarro. Why do they call economics the dismal science? Well, the phrase the dismal science actually goes back to the time of Thomas Malthus several hundred years ago. Malthus was a philosopher and economist who predicted that population would grow faster than the food supply and a lot of people would starve to death. Not exactly a pleasant result. Uh, of course, that didn't happen because of great advancements in technology. But the fact of the matter is, economics invariably deals with dismal, difficult, tough problems. Unemployment, inflation, macroeconomic shocks, oil price shocks, things like that. I do think it's aptly named, although, as we will see in this course, it's also a very interesting, albeit dismal, topic. Another student then asked, which branch of economics is more important, macroeconomics or microeconomics? That's really hard to say. I mean, it really depends on what you do in your life and what your business is. But I think they're equally important. Macroeconomics is useful for giving you the big economic picture so that even if you're in business, you learn from macroeconomics how to manage around the business cycle. But microeconomics in business gives you insights into specific business decisions regarding things like how to efficiently run your factories and how to set your wages and how to set your prices. So uh, together, I think they make a great combo, and I hope by the end of this course, you'll agree with me. This ends Lecture 1.